we have a very tiny SRO uh, apartment in Manhattan. Uh, it's something like 20 feet by 40 feet or, or less. And uh, it's easy for us to murmur, but we cannot do that because we find out in the book of Numbers what happens to the murmurers. And, you know, you may not have a perfect life as a believer, but you will be blessed and God will reward you for your obedience and for not succumbing to fear and rebellion. And the place where this happened was called Kadesh or Kadesh Barnea. And it was situated on the edge of Edom, about 70 miles from Hebron, 50 miles from Beersheba. And we're talking about the wilderness of Zin. Uh, it's mentioned, uh, and you may not even pick up on this, but when Abraham uh, and the uh, other Pedalaomer, uh, king of Elam allies, uh, have their war, it is it mentions Kadesh, Genesis 14, 7, and also Hagar at uh, the Beer the High Roy uh, mentions also Kadesh, Genesis 16, 14, or Genesis 14, 7 for the previous uh, reference. So whenever it's mentioned, if you really know the Bible, you you breathe a sigh of of knowledge that that there's something bad going to happen there, because God told them to leave Sinai and take an eleven an eleven day journey. One one eleven to Kadesh Barnea and go right on in and take the land. And they could have, but there was an evil report and there was rebellion. And this left the people to wander in the wilderness. And while they were still camped at Kadesh, there was another rebellion, Numbers chapter 16, verses one to three. And um, we know what happened to Korah and those rebels. Miriam died and was buried there. Moses disobeyed. He was told to speak to the rock. He struck the rock. And um, also Aaron died and was buried there. So Kadesh Barnea is a very important area in the Torah, and you have to know the events that happened there, and they clearly demonstrate the peril of rebelling against God, murmuring and complaining about God's directions, his provisions, and also the danger of refusing to follow orders. And here we are, this tiny SRO, single resident, occupancy and here we are doing this great work and when people look back on this they will say well you know it wasn't them look where they were look what they had look what, what was going on here we got a woman that needs a kidney transplant we got a man that's 81 years old and they're living in this tiny place uh, on peanuts and yet God is doing this great work so we won't give the glory to them we'll have to give it to God and when they were wandering in the wilderness 
And while God was also at the same time preparing them to enter the promised land, you get that whole story in the book of Numbers, where in chapter 1 you get one number, and in chapter 26 you get another number. And it shows you that the people marked out for punishment actually were punished. And you, you can see that from the two censuses. And if you go to afii.org forward slash afii.pdf, you'll see that on the book of Numbers. When I was living in Hell's Kitchen, my office was down there. I slept on the floor for almost 10 years. And when the Lord had me just get up and type this book, I typed it sequentially, one page after the other, for all the book. Now, when you look at the book, you say, there's no way anybody could do that. He would have to break it down into parts and then uh, deal with each one and then throw it together uh, in some kind of word processing fashion. No way could he type it sequentially one page after the other, but that's exactly what happened. And you got to understand the supernaturalness of the work that people do for God. Numbers is actually a sequel to the book of Exodus. Exodus shows them escaping from slavery and arriving at Mount Sinai, receiving the Aseris Hadibro Sin Commandments, and also other parts of the Torah. But then the sequel, the book of Numbers, picks up the story with the people still encamped at Sinai, and there's a census, and then we see another census, chapter 26, and we see what's going to happen for the next nearly 40 years till they finally arrive at Moab on the eastern side of the Jordan River, ready to occupy the land of Canaan. So an enslaved people are redeemed, delivered, and prepared to take possession of the land that God himself had promised many years before to Abraham and his descendants. And the work that I started in 1971 with the Orthodox Jewish Bible is now being completed with the triglot of the Tanakh. We already have the triglot of the Bredad Shah. And the Lord knew in 1971 what was going to happen in 2024 and what I would be doing now. And he's bringing it to pass. To God be the glory. My friend, remember what my mother said to me. Relax. You aren't doing anything. I know you. God is doing the whole thing. And she was right. God held his nose and pulled a rat out of the rat barrel and cleaned him off and changed him into a new creature and then assigned this work and brought it to pass. And all the glory goes to God. But if you'll notice, God supplies our needs. You say, how did he do that out there in the desert all those years? We're talking two generations, actually. Well, he sent manna, he sent quail, he sent water. Still, they had this stubborn spirit. And finally, Moses, in ex ex exasperation, disobeyed God, and even he was not allowed to go into the promised land because he had violated God's command and proved himself to be a sinner who needed to be saved by grace as well. So if you try to construct a theology where Moses did all these mitzvahs and God was obliged to give him the promised land 
because of his mitzvahs and his righteousness and, what the, and the fact that he was this great tzaddik, well, that just shows you haven't read the Bible. He was instructed to speak to the rock. Instead, he struck the rock. And because of this disobedience, he was, you know, it says the wages of sin is death. He died. He died outside the promised land. He died shortly after viewing the land, but he viewed it at a distance from atop Mount Nebo in Moab. You get that uh, story in Deuteronomy 34, which I just did today in an interlinear Yiddish at the top, English at the bottom. This is all preparing for the uh, engineers that will automate the transliteration and will add a third rung and this will make a triglock so anybody in the world can pronounce understand and read the Yiddish Torah and Nevi'im and Ketuvim the Tanakh so we're talking about 39 or 40 years from 1445 BCE when they left their encampment at Mount Sinai to 1405 BCE when they entered the land of Canaan, the land promised to them as an inheritance by crossing the Jordan River near Jericho under a new leader, Yehoshua, Yeshua, Joshua, Ben Nun. So yes, there were years of preparation. There were years where there was punishment, chastisement, correction, and the harsh life in the desert wilderness was actually a preparation because they had to go in and push out the Canaanites. And that meant that they couldn't be lounging around a palace in Pharaoh's house in Egypt, but they had to learn obedience from the things they suffered and all of that is told to you in the book of Numbers. And it's, you know, they could have, in 11 days, they could have gone right on in. But they, they didn't proceed immediately after leaving Mount Sinai to uh, take the 11 days, go to Kadesh Barnea, and then go right on in and take Canaan. No, there was a committee of 12, the heads of the 12 tribes. And they went in to Canaan along the southern border of Canaan to spy out the land and check the defenses. And when they saw the giants and the fortifications, 10 of the 12 gave an evil report and said, we can't do it. Two of them gave a good report, but the people refused. And uh, there was now two generations of aimless wandering with bodies littering the wilderness. And finally, the children, the adults, were punished and they died. Their children, however, heard a sermon from Moses, in, which is the book of Deuteronomy, and then they went in. And uh, this is one of the first five books of the Tanakh. It's called the the Torah, and Moses 
wrote it. I mean, it says, now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys. It's it's Moses' journal, actually. Just like the book of Acts is Luke's journal. Or the book of Nehemiah is Nehemiah's journal. And other books are like that. It's good to keep a journal. My friend, my Bible has got all kinds of dates. I was able to tell Linda's primary doctor her uh, the how many years she had been going to him because I had it written down in my Bible. He couldn't have told you, but I could tell you. Why? Because I'm keeping a journal in my Bible. Your Bible should be marked up. We should have desperate little prayers in the margins. It should have underlining and highlighting. It should have the uh, tear stains. Because just as Moses kept his journal, and it says in Numbers 33, 2, that while they were going through this wilderness trek, and people were dying, and they weren't getting where they were wanting to go, and there was rebellion in the camp. Moses wrote it all down. It became the book of Numbers. So, uh, Numbers was probably written around 1404 BCE, and it presents a God who corrects his wrath is real. And if his people are disobedient, they will experience that wrath sooner or later. And yes, he's a God of grace, but he's also a God not to be trifled with. He will because he loves his children and they are his, not Mom Zareem, he will chastise them. What father doesn't discipline his children? God is our father. He is our shepherd. We shall not lack. He, he provides, but he's not to be trifled with. And if you don't believe that, read the book of Numbers. Through their rebellion, the, I'm talking about breaking the covenant, uh, even Moses was not exempt from God's wrath. So don't get on a high horse thinking that, you, that you're God's favorite and that it's just grace, 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 and he will never... Uh, chastise you. That is not scriptural. But even in his wrath, he didn't give up. We see that, that they did get into the land, at least their children, at least Caleb and Joshua. It's true, Miriam, Moses, and Aaron died without entering the land, but even the false prophet Balaam uh, said, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. So that's why my Bible is marked up. I'm claiming those promises. And you know what? God is actually bringing it to pass. But notice, there's two censuses. The, the ones counted in the two censuses in the book of Numbers add up to a, about 600,000 people. But they are different people. The first census is really like a body count because those people are gonna die by and large. The second census is their replacement. And my friend, if I, if, I, if I rebel against God, 
and I don't do what I'm doing here. If I say, oh, you know, this SRO, it's just too hard. There are roaches here. We've tried everything to get them exterminated. We don't have enough room. We've got uh, the entire Moshe Rosen operation that's in a uh, several story building in San Francisco crammed into a little tiny SRO. Who can do this? And but besides that, Linda needs a kidney transplant. And it's all this finances and we don't have it. And I'm just going to moan and murmur and, and rebel. And God gets somebody else to do it. Well, he will. That'll be the end of me and somebody else will finish this work. That's the kind of God we're dealing with. And if you don't believe it, uh, compare the two sentences. The one in chapter one of Numbers which I'm going to interlinearize tomorrow, and the one in chapters 26. In each case, they add up to an army of more than 600,000 people. But they're different people because the rebels were replaced just like King Saul was replaced by King David. God can replace you. Look, if you don't want to play ball with God, if you don't want to do your studies, if you say, oh, I'm just too busy, it's just too hard, I can't do it, not even not even one sentence a day, okay. But remember who you're dealing with. God has a wrath which you, my friend, do not want to kindle. Paul tried to reason with him. He said, are, are you able to fight with God? Can, can you fight God? Are you able to do that? Listen, if I can't get in the ring with Mike Tyson, I sure can't get in the ring with God. It's better to come out with your hands up and play ball with the Lord. And if you don't believe that, study the book of Numbers. And it says here, Hashem spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting, on the first of the second month in the second year after their exodus from the Eretz, uh, the land of Egypt, saying, take a census, take a census. And I pray that none will be lost. I pray that your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and not erased thereof. I pray that you will not murmur or rebel. That you will learn to say with Job, even if he slay me, yet will I serve him that you will look at our master and see, and see how he had to learn obedience from what he suffered. And if so, how much more must we learn obedience? And so we have to see our situation with divine eye spectacles from God's point of view, why has God put us in this situation with whatever hardships or, or problems, with whatever financial difficulties or medical issues or whatever are involved? Why has God done this? He has a benign purpose. He's allowed this for our good. He will work it for good for us. He will turn everything around and work it for good like he did with Joseph and Yaakov. Sold by his brothers into slavery. Sold to Potiphar. Unjustly accused 
by his wife, thrown into the, the dungeon, forgotten, even though he did miraculous interpretations of dreams of high officials. And then finally, when the time was right, pulled up in the purpose of God to change clothes, bathe and shave, and go before Pharaoh to stand at the right hand of God. Yes, he was humbled, but then he was exalted. You have to believe that that will be the case with you. And therefore, you will not murmur and rebel. But instead, you will see God preparing a table, even in the presence of your enemies, with goodness and mercy following you all the days of your life, with you dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. And at the end, being able to say, I have fought the good fight, I've kept the faith, I've finished the race. Notice in 2 Timothy, Paul does not murmur about his situation. He does, however, warn us that certain ones have deserted him. And uh, especially one person. And that's a warning that we should not desert we don't want to go AWOL. We want to stay at our post through thick and thin and serve the Lord unto the last breath that we take on our deathbed. And God will bless us. Moshik ben Dovid, come into my heart, forgive my sins, take control of my life. And I will serve you and follow you all the days of my life. And everybody said, 